the clicker here. Okay. You're done with it, right? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. So I, I met Michael uh, last year at the Ashland conference. Uh, we both presented, and um, uh, he's been here a couple times since then. And uh, I was interested in getting him to speak at Lamp, and I'm really happy he's here to do so. Um, yeah, see if I can get that. So Michael Scott, also known as Real Michael Scott for Office, <laughs> and I never watched the show, so I don't know. <laughs> has worked in visual arts going back to the beginning of the 80s. Michael created numerous thought-provoking ex expressions in various mediums. However, music and film have always been his love. For more than a decade, Michael fought for his life. His world almost ended several years ago due to many health issues, last being a cancer scare. After watching friends and family pass away, Michael searched for a way to feel. He found plant medicine that saved his life. This made that such plant medicines could be and is illegal was too much to bear. His path was clear. It's time for the truth to be told. It's time for positive change. Michael sought out to create positive change. He ran for office, uh, for office a couple times for state legislative representative as a libertarian. Spent several years grassroots lobbying for human rights. Michael also founded the nonprofit Project Positive Change. Uh, Project PC has worked tirelessly to find ways to find better ways for community, communities to come together, one of which is positive change for uh, mentoring centers. Michael has spent the last several years traveling nationally and internationally sharing what he's been learning. He's shot hundreds of hours about plant medicine, politics, interviewing doctors, scientists, and researchers. Please check out www.projectpc.org to find out where Michael will be next and see what videos will be releasing soon. And Michael's uh, put some of his information here, so feel free to grab anything up here. There's also a sign-up list, and he'll go over his um, project a little bit more so you can learn more about it. But if anyone interested, please sign the volunteer sign-up sheet. And um, without further ado, please welcome Michael Scott. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like it showed up well. I, I'm afraid if you turn the lights off, it's, you're going to be super dark. Is this okay? Okay, as long as we can see it. Cool. Because I got video on there and stuff too. Or is it two lights? You can turn off. Well, let's, let's, we can try it. See. Um, yeah, is that, is that, is that, is that on? Is that Thank you. <laughs> kind of how I intended it, I hope. <laughs> We did that. It doesn't. It does the same thing those do. I, I know. I have tons of that footage. <laughs> uh, so anyway, thanks a lot, Brad. Uh, yeah, like I said, that, like, we met back at uh, presenting in Ashland uh, last year, and uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing. So some of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, bit, but uh, yeah, the whole thing of cannabis and uh, yeah, what do we know about cannabis? Um, is it some kind of uh, devil's lettuce? It's some kind of evil substance, or is it some kind of panacea? Uh, some kind of uh, amazing substance from nature? Well, I want to talk to you initially about why I'm here, and uh, kind of what's in the thing he read, of course, is that cannabis saved my life. Uh, I went through God. 12 years probably of being really super ill and the latter part of that uh, was a cancer scare and uh, I was on massive amounts of uh, opiates and other pharmaceuticals. I was suffering from narcolepsy, um, heart, a large heart, uh, sleep apnea. Um, it, was, it was bad. The latter part was they were um, funny that I had uh, quick growing masses on my torso and then Later, as I was scheduling surgery for that and preparing for what the horse would be, uh, my throat was bleeding and I went in and they said that it was spreading to my throat and my tonsil, so I had five places in my throat taken out. However, I took cannabis instead of doing chemo or radiation, I changed my diet, etc. And it started me on a path, so I had been a filmmaker, went to film school here in LA, etc. Worked in television and film. Uh, and then moved in Northern California and then also came here to LA and did feature film work, etc. And um, so anyways, when I started to wake up kind of what was going on and freaking me out, I had lost friends and family to cancer and such and I wanted to you know, do something about it and I 
grabbed the camera immediately and I started shooting stuff. So I shot again tons of footage, meeting people all over the place and watching as the whole industry unfolds, which is something I'll talk a little more about. And, um, you know, crazy stuff. Plus, I asked the Kansas community what could I do to help. And uh, initially, after they gave me tons of advice and careful what you asked for, because they said you should run for office, and so I did. <laughs> and uh, that's a whole other story. I won't go into a lot today, but uh, for another time. Um, in any case, when I started going to do the documentation, things really got tough in Washington State, uh, with, from going from medical to recreational. Um, and I was running around capturing, you know, things that were happening and uh, I wanted to document some of the people that were being affected by it. And one of those people that I met was a family and their little baby, Maddie. Maddie uh, has a well, rare ger uh, genetic disease, uh, Zillerger syndrome, uh, destroys the, rape, the white brain matter and uh, she was saved by using cannabis, uh, initially CBD and later THC. Um, and uh, there are a whole bunch to go to that. She, most children with this kind of uh, disease that die at birth or in the first part of the year, and Maddie had turned five last November 1st. So quite amazing, right? So let's, I talk a little bit about the history of cannabis, but not the uh, Hollywood version of it, uh, more of some of the truth about it is where I'd like to go with this next. So let's watch this. Marijuana History 101, or should I say extremely brief Marijuana History 101. It's big, complicated, and we'll only be able to scratch the surface, so let's get started. The first thing that strikes one as odd when looking at the history of marijuana, which is also known as cannabis, is how very much legal it once was. In fact, it wasn't only legal, it just happened to be one of the largest agricultural crops in the world, including the United States. You see, cannabis can also be hemp. And just what is hemp? Well, it's by and large the most robust, durable, natural soft fiber on the face of this planet. Up until 1883 and for thousands of years before, cannabis hemp was the largest agricultural crop in the world. It had thousands of uses and products. The majority of fabric, lighting oil, medicines, paper, and fiber came from hemp. The first marijuana law to exist in the United States was a law ordering farmers to grow hemp. Benjamin Franklin used it to start one of America's first paper mills. The first two copies of the Declaration of Independence were written on cannabis hemp paper. Up until the 1800s, most of the textiles in the United States were made with hemp. 50% of medicine marketed in the last half of the 19th century was made from cannabis. Even Queen Victoria used the resin extracts from cannabis to alleviate her menstrual cramps. But the funny thing about industrial hemp was you couldn't get high from it. Yet, it was lumped in with the following, which also made little sense. Reefer madness. In the early 20th century, yellow journalism had surfaced. Articles depicted blacks and Mexicans as frenzied beasts who would smoke marijuana, play devil's music, and heap disrespect and viciousness on the readership, a majority of which happened to be white. Some offenses included looking at a white woman twice, laughing at a white person, or even stepping on white men's shadows. And this ended up leading to a law in the form of a tax stamp. A tax stamp that would not only include marijuana, but also hemp and cannabis medicines. It speculated that hemp's potential for an abundance of new products was going to be in direct competition with other sources. And this, added to the reefer madness, led to the eventual downfall of all forms of cannabis. Popular Mechanics magazine had actually prepared an article entitled, New Billion Dollar Crop. Hemp was touted as being able to produce more than 5,000 textile products from its thread-like fiber and more than 25,000 products from its cellulose, ranging from dynamite to cellophane. Its superiority as a source for paper was also becoming known, especially with the development of hemp processing equipment. Now the new marijuana tax act was all fine and dandy, except for one thing. If you wanted to grow hemp, you needed to buy a stamp, but they weren't giving any out to anybody. And so, in effect, all forms of cannabis became illegal. Things pretty much stayed that way until World War II, when the government decided that hemp once again was a good thing and produced a video, Hemp for Victory. But by the time the war was over, hemp again became bad. And in 1948, when the marijuana law once again came into question, Congress recognized that marijuana was made illegal for the wrong reason. It didn't make people violent at all. It made them pacifists. 
The communists would use it to weaken America's will to fight. Congress now voted to keep marijuana illegal for the exact opposite reason they had outlawed it in the first place. And all through the years, report after report, commissioned by everybody, from the mayor of New York to the president of the United States, has come back with the view that marijuana should have no criminal penalty attached to it. Yet, marijuana remains as illegal today as it did nearly 70 years ago. So, an older film, but my question now is, is cannabis legal? We'll come back to that. Let's talk about medical uh, next. And again, I have another clip that I think is kind of important to show some of the information about that. The conventional wisdom, which uh, goes to the oral history of China, is that the Emperor Shang Nen wrote the first uh, Chinese Materia Medica, and that it contained uh, cannabis. He is alleged to have written it in 2637 BC, which would be uh, almost 5,000 years ago. The oldest known copy of that goes back to somewhere between 100 BC and 100 AD. The oldest actual written record of the use of cannabis as a medicine is found in the writings of the Indian, as in India, Ayurvedic medicine, in which that uh, a piece of uh, history is dated at somewhere between 1100 and 1700 BC. Up until the beginning of the 20th century, cannabis was probably the second or third most commonly used medicine in the world. Uh, cannabis was found in uh, patent medicines that were manufactured by such uh, familiar names as Eli Lilly, Squibb, Merck, Park Davis, uh, Smith Brothers, you know, the Smith Brothers cough drops. Uh, and it was available uh, powdered, uh, chopped, uh, whole, and uh, as tinctures. <clears throat> Amazing history, right? So, what do we know about cannabis? Well, most people know, you know, cannabidiol, CBD is one of the most that everybody seems to know about, or THC. And there's all kinds of different things to connect to that, but the plant is quite complex. Um, I, again, I've traveled a ton, and I've met a lot of different people um, all over the world, and one of the places that I went uh, this last year was to the uh, uh, Institute of Cannabis Research in Colorado, and one of the people I met there was Dr. Alejandro Macrianes, and um, he talked about what, uh, about our endocannabinoid system, how the plant works, so I've got a clip of when I visit there that I'd like you to watch.
Sorry that I was low. I we changed it out, thought it was fixed, but apparently not. But uh, I hope you heard pretty much what he's talking about again, and to clarify more of CD1, CD2, and for our brain and for our body. And that was something that was, you know, pretty profound for me when I was starting to search for how I was going to heal. Uh, I met people that had inoperable brain tumors, which told go home and die. And I was sitting there talking to them a couple of years after that, and they went and found cannabis, and they used it in their life today. And I was like, wow, you know, understanding more of how native cannabis was to our body and our receptors. And one of the things in that, when I was looking at all my research and trying to find stuff, um, I saw the weed series, I think it was CNN, right, that they did, where they did a little studies and talked about things, and it was fascinating to watch how that unfolded. Um, they talked about, uh, you know, concerns of the developing brain. It was another thing that's amazing to me when I did a ton of research on this about the, the Jamaican study where they uh, followed, uh, and in fact, NIDA is the one that uh, <laughs> funded this, and the doctor, I think it was five year span that they followed these children or these parents, so, you know, the set of women that didn't use cannabis was set that did, and uh, the mothers used pre, during, and, and uh, after, in other words, breastfeeding when when they came back with the studies, uh, it was pretty amazing that you know the children were more well adapted and uh, um, intelligent, etc. There were a lot of benefits that they found in that. So, uh, pretty amazing stuff. Um, again, talking about the developing brain. Um, when I went to the conference in Colorado, uh, I met with uh, Dr. Carl Hart again. He was the one that was part of the CNN Weed series. And later he recanted on, you know, more or less saying, well, the research wasn't what we thought and uh, so forth. So, yeah, it was pretty amazing listening to him and talk to him about that. Um, again, cannabis, we know, it's so we're, that's where, well, we're, we're learning and we're finding more information out about all the different kinds of effects. And there's many different charts and many kinds of studies that already have been going on that show, you know, for pain relief, reduction of inflammation, you know, obviously people know about seizures and stuff, but I was on, you know, three types of pharmaceutical uh, and blood pressure medicines. I'm on none and haven't been for several years any pharmaceuticals at all. And I use it as a daily regimen for my health. And what I, you know, started as I'm going through all this learning and, you know, trying to figure out and how can I share this knowledge? You know, I have family that was in law enforcement and military and medicine that were like, yeah, right, this is not really, you know, this, uh, what you think it is. And, I found that cannabis, it works to help balance you. In fact, I found an uh, old video of a doctor, I can't find it now, it was on YouTube again about five years ago, and he did a little graphic and it was two uh, images and one was like, this is your uh, football team and this is you and you're missing a running back and when you consume enough of medicinal cannabis, it fills in for your running back and helps put you in balance so your body can start to heal. And again, it goes into about the receptors, et cetera, right? And uh, along that way, I also found out, you know, endocannabinoid deficiency. And Dr. Bob was one of the people I got to meet uh, last year, too, and had seen him in some of the very first research I was looking for. And he talked about the blips, backward-looking endocannabinoid deficient people. And uh, Dr. Bob says that the worst afflicted are politicians. <laughs> and, so, and he says, you know, imagine why. Well, you know, you don't feel so good, you know, you're kind of sick, you can't think about the future, you're not forward looking, you're kind of dwelling in the past. Um, yeah, politicians. So, uh, <laughs> um, and then, you know, as I was going through the research and meeting all these people, I, I met a ton of different folks in all these areas, and I'll explain further in my nonprofit and the whole purpose of it. But uh, what led me into the whole thing of the amphibians, you know, and uh, all this other stuff. Uh, studying about people with post-traumatic stress and, and it came up with, you know, the pineal gland and uh, how, um, as you saw in that, I mean, you talked about, you know, we have 
all these connections in this and, and I'm, okay, canvas, hmm, this was really big. So when I went to Ashland, I was, you know, really thinking about that. What, how does this work and what I'm going to present. One of the groups I've worked with, with uh, it has been is a 22 Community. And if you don't understand what the name of that means is that our government came up with a study and they omitted, unfortunately, some states and other <coughs> data in that, but every single day, 22 veterans commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, my family served and I've lost family in service, um, you know, and I'm part of the American Legion and things like that. And just, you know, it's amazing to me that they're being given these things and they're, you know, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, and they're drinking and things and they're not resolving it. And I'm starting to find out that they have this amazing plant that could help change things. So, um, and I started learning more and meeting, I've interviewed people and studying the plant and it started <laughs> looking at, you know, other things, psilocybin and stuff, and I kind of come up with this like hypothesis that's starting to kind of play out some, which is that cannabis could work as a, is like kind of a defrag, you know? Um, and, and I believe that it's kind of uh, been overlooked some ways in the same realm of psilocybin and DMT and ayahuasca and stuff. And I think that, you know, my opinion at this point is that we're, we really should be using it, hemp and cannabis as a base to get us into our health. We're endocannabinoid deficient, so it's one of the best things in the world that we could possibly consume and was part of our history going back as far as we know in every aspect. So cannabis to me, when I've studied, you know, interviewing veterans, they're talking about how they're, you know, having night terrors and things and they consume it and they're able to calm down, but it doesn't get rid of it. They keep having it over and over. So this is why I was on a search of trying to figure out, okay, what else can we do about this? And that's what, again, led me to, you know, the whole idea of, well, oh, so psilocybin, huh, you know, how does this work? So I've been talking to different doctors and researchers and things ongoing and learning more about that. In fact, again, when we went to exploring um, psychedelics in Ashland, um, Thomas Lee and some other folks, and I've been talking to them about how, you know, the receptors work and um, different, you know, aspects of that. And I really believe more so now that, um, we're looking closer at where, how, you know, uh, using the other stronger medicines will then unlock the trauma, allows you to see the things that are causing the trauma and they can release it and go forward and that changes that and gives them a reboot instead of a defrag is kind of the terms that I've been using in that, right? Um, so in the beginning, you know, again, it's been close to five years of my work and uh, this is one of the people that we interviewed in the very beginning. I got back from Iraq um, and things were fine for the first year after I got out. I mean, first year and a half, I thought everything was normal. Um, things seemed fine. Uh, and then in 2012, I ultimately tried into my life three times. Um, and the third time was, is, uh, I asked myself, I was sitting there with 45 in my hand and I asked myself, I said, well, what are you going to die for? And the reality was that I wasn't going to die for anything. Um, and I didn't, I didn't like that. Cause if I would have died in Iraq, I would have died for something. You know what I mean? I would have died for the guy on my left or my right. Um, and to be able to do that by your own hands, that's, so that was ashamed, ashamed of it. You know what I mean? I felt very shameful of myself for it, and I had a hard time, still have a hard time admitting to it, because you're associating yourself to a negative entity, and then you're being held essentially responsible for that because of that connection to it. Um, and I think that's why maybe. The suicide thing is so hard for veterans, you know what I mean? I, I originally started uh, cannabis and the uh, VA therapy, was, which was the pills. Um, I was using cannabis though to sleep, because um, Ambien wasn't doing shit. Mm -hmm. Ambien was on, I think, 60 or 70 milligrams of Ambien. Wasn't doing anything. I still don't sleep that well, uh, but the cannabis at least helps. What cannabis helped me do is, though, I was ultimately on 17 prescriptions a day. And at one point, that included uh, some methadone, some hydrocodone, some Valium, Prozosin, Methacarbamol, Ambien, uh, Beneflaxine, Tramadol, uh, Lorazepam. Uh, there's probably a couple more. I've been on Zoloft, Xanax, Prozac. Uh, I mean, I've been on everything you can think of. Um, and when they told me last summer, what more do you want from me? That's when the light went off in my head that they're just here to cash checks and get really good dumb shit. You know what I mean? So I realized that. When I was going out into the woods and I was using just cannabis by ourselves, I never took my pills with me. You know, I didn't. I always use something you forget in the packing list or whatever, but the pot always went. You know what I mean? Because you're trying to go out and enjoy nature. 
And so I realized that when I was going out into nature and I was using cannabis exclusively, it was really helping my problems, ultimately. Because I didn't have the anxiety, I didn't have the rage, I didn't have the depression. I do have it every now and then, but I think what combat veteran does have depression? You've seen life black and white. So um, I use cannabis now uh, exclusively. Um, I use CBDs more regularly as a non-psychoactive ingredient for the day. Uh, I do use high doses of THC moderately throughout the day though, but that's because of the, so the social anxiety. And then uh, I've got herniated discs in my lower back that kind of create some problems. And so one thing about the pills though is, is that you're like a walking zombie. And I guess the easiest way to describe it is in training, at least for an infantryman, they train you to react to everything. Um, you don't think about it. Because um, when seconds matter and your life matters, you just got to react to it. So with the pills, I never thought about anything. If something would trigger me or somebody would piss me off or I'd get depressed or something would happen, I would just react to it. And usually I would end up hurting somebody, hurting myself, or creating a situation that got me ultimately in trouble with the law. Um, and I don't have that problem anymore. And I do have moments of rage and I don't think what individual doesn't. Um, but what I like about the cannabis, especially the CBD aspect of it, is it slows everything down. Um, so instead of going 200 miles an hour, I might be going 80, maybe 100, but no more than like 120. Uh, and I can just process the situation. The easiest example I give people is if you've got a three lane highway. Um, I always travel in the outside lane just because I feel the safest. Well, the four on pills, if I had somebody in this outside lane going over to cut across, my immediate reaction was to get defensive, be an asshole, and just you know, do whatever I had to do to figure out the situation. But ultimately, they might not even be able to come over and cut me off. You know, I was just reacting to it. Well, now with the CBDs and the cannabis, I see is, is that I'm able to process that. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that guy's going to cut over, and then I'm able to see, well, is he going to continue? And if he continues, then I can, you know, take the next step. But it's allowing me to take those steps instead of just react to, you know, step three or whatever. I've done several years of this now, and I can't wait to show some of the things of what the progress from these people, you know, and I mean, so this guy and others were brand new to this. I mean, when we, when we interviewed him and others, they were just had gotten to the point of where some of them just started. He had done it a little while before. And it's kind of amazing, again, to show where they have, you know, where they were to where they are now and how it's changed their lives using cannabis. Um, you know, again, so as I went down this path trying to figure this out and still trying to learn and, and explore it, uh, again, I had never heard of maps, but I was about so happy to hear that that existed. And uh, again, as I went further, uh, uh, Paul and Brad and such, is and uh, learning about the uh, lamps and uh, now being involved to help with the uh, event coming up in June, which was amazing. Um, so I'm looking forward to how that will further the knowledge and uh, exposure for the plant medicine. Uh, one of the other places I went was to uh, Can Med in Boston, the very first one that they did at the Harvard Medical Center. They're actually now going to be here uh, also this year. Uh, and this is going to be quite amazing uh, what they've done and very unique is what they have uh, going on. So. Um, and I'll speak a little further about uh, some involvement with those, what those guys are doing. But I met Raphael Mishulam for the first time there and interviewed him. And I did this last year also at the uh, uh, cannabis research. Um, into uh, some shaman of mine that wanted to share the ancient knowledge and that uh, he needed help with that. So that was, again, another piece of the mission kind of that was unfolding. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, I started, I know some of the history of how things have gone in the past. Uh, and of how the plant medicines could help us. So I tried to do what I can. It was very amazing at this conference. Um, uh, Brian Two Feathers of the Dakota Nation, the spiritual leader, was there and uh, I captured this little clip in, uh, that he has a message for us, too. I have a prophecy with me. The plants are talking to me and they're saying things are going to get hard. And they're telling me, these sisters, these ones and these are for this and that. And I can't go into all of it. And some of it's scary. But we're on the right track is what I want to tell people, that as long as we 
start trusting in ourselves and what's good for ourselves instead of trusting in the government and drug companies, you're on the right track. Because you yourself know what it's done for you, the medicine. I don't have to explain nothing to any of you that ever smoked it or tried it. That's the beauty of it. So people that don't like it, they don't have to use it. It's not for them. Very interesting fellow. Um, again, a lot more work to go do in that area. And it, again, it's amazing how I started this journey and <clears throat> talking to my doctors initially when I was so ill over the years and brought up the whole thing of cannabis and it was like they're nuts, you know, people just want to get high. And as you're seeing, as I'm showing you some of the stuff I've seen, it's like, wow. It's quite amazing, profound, and, and it's something that we need to understand. And so even some of the stuff that I'm talking to you guys about, I know that there are varying levels of, of understanding already, but I've tried to put in several different things so that I think there's some key things that are really important um, that I hope folks will know about this and some of the people involved in it. So if you've ever heard of Rick Simpson oil, that was again kind of a catchphrase for people. That was one of the things that I found in the beginning when I did my searches, you know, was the cannabis oil. Um, Rick Simpson's story, if you don't know it, please go look it up. And I mean, this man went through this whole process again, kind of like myself, didn't even know what the heck that was. And because of different issues that unfolded, it put him in this situation. And um, he actually started making, oil, uh, growing tons of plants in, in Canada and making it into oil and saving people's lives. And they throw him in jail. You know, I mean, tons of garbage that's happened to this poor guy. <coughs> Um, so I don't agree with the method that he used, but he used what he had. He uses like a NAFTA, a, like rubbing alcohol for extracting oil. I would use what, you know, myself and others that have made medicine and use, you know, like uh, Everclear alcohol instead. I would never put something in my body that, you know, that, that medicine that way. But anyways, look him up. Another one was Jack Hera. So, uh, and Ed Adair. Jack Hera, amazing. If you don't know the story, you really need to uh, check it out. And uh, it's kind of weird too, because the whole thing of me being in this, prep, this path of doing these things is that, uh, you know, I went to film school here and I've been on Venice Beach and stuff. And uh, when I would go and walk around sometimes, uh, I, there was this weird guy that would hang out at the beach. And uh, at times I walked by and there was groups of people around him and I kind of avoided it or whatever. And one day I was walking back by and there he was and he walked over and started talking to me and had me some paperwork and, you know, brochure and shook my hand, tried to tell me about how hemp was going to save the world, and I was like, yeah, okay, dude, whatever, and went down the path. <laughs> Little did I know, he was Jack Hera, and then uh, Ed Adair, I forget what that head shop is on Rosita Boulevard, I keep forgetting the name, I've got to look it up again, but when I first came to look at film school, yes, Captain Ed, Ed. Yeah. and I had came to look at film schools, and uh, I saw it when I was younger, you know, there were head shops where I lived in Northern California and I was like, I gotta go see that. So I went in there and I actually talked to uh, Ed Adair, which was his partner in crime, so to speak. So sadly, Ed died later. Um, but anyway, it's just weird how things, you know, <laughs> unfold. That thing in the world I thought I'd be doing is standing here talking to you guys at all about any of this. Um, but uh, The Emperor Wear No Clothes is the book that Jack wrote, and some people don't, you know, there's a lot of whatever, you know, was he right, is he wrong, whatever, but he should, it's worth a read, I think, to look at. And there's also The Emperor of Hemp uh, video that was pretty amazing, that I really think they did a good job that you can see that kind of shows some of the stuff. And So that's important, look at that. And then, you know, talking about research. Well, we say we don't have any. You know, and as I went down this path, I'm finding all kinds of people that are doing it. Obviously, some of the people that I've met were more in the area where I'm at, and I'm still finding there's a ton of people like that, for instance, that, you know, you guys are doing things, I'm learning there's more people out there that are, you know, going down this path. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, meeting uh, uh, Raphael and uh, Sunel and uh, Sue Sicily, she, uh, was the one that was fighting for uh, studying veterans and she got fired from Arizona State because of her work. Um, and she finally did get, by the way, the, the rights to, and they sent her stuff from NIDA, which was like dirt weed to do the study. And anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, Dr. Paul Hart that I met, I mentioned earlier, um, again, amazing work in Aliando, et cetera, you know. Uh, there's a bunch of folks out there. Uh, 
project um, cvd.org is really important if you want to see a bunch of information that's been really gone um, uh, they've done a really good job of adding a ton of information and different types of research and things that are going on um, and uh, Kevin McKernan uh, the guy in the blue jacket he's the one that did the human genome mapping so Kevin uh, genomics and he's the one actually that they did can met what I was mentioning earlier and so what they've been doing over the years is they've been collecting data um, on, uh, on cannabis. They've been collecting samples. So what they are working on, amongst a bunch of other things, a ton of, you know, really well-qualified people that are, you know, pouring over the stuff, uh, they're doing the cannabis genome mapping. So they're looking at the way that they could then cross-pollinate or, you know, genosplice a cannabis plant that would match your system and it will be your method for you, which I think is exciting. And he's saying that we're getting much closer than being able to do that. Um, so it kind of drives me nuts on, you know, where the propaganda, so to speak, or the, the discussion that happens about what we don't understand. And in fact, one, the last trip I came here, uh, my flight got delayed and uh, funny, my shuttle was left at 420 and then uh, my flight didn't go. So or are they overbooked it and I got bumped to the next flight, which it was leaving at 620, I ended up at 720, and I ended up on the next plane, and then I ended up sitting next to a Tacoma, Washington Tacoma judge, who actually told me to, you know, well, maybe they need more research. And I thought, oh, you mean like 6630507 that the government owns the patent on? And she got real silent on me. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it, so anyways, as we go, uh, you know, the things I've done, you know, it's really hard for me, you know, to hear these things about, you know, it's a dangerous substance when this, you know, little girl, I, when I went to see her, again, I was supposed to be capturing her dying. She was about to die. And she was, you know, really, really sick, puffed up, barely functioning, going through seizures, but they were helping her with the medicine. And I watched as it unfold from CBD to THC and THC, we believe, we haven't been able to have any research to verify it, but facilitate the, the fatty stream acid that the cannabis actually helped facilitate with the part for genetic disease. And so she didn't die, but she ended up with a ton of problems because of the progression of the disease, but also taking 26 pharmaceuticals, which was, you know, she ended up deaf and blind. That picture is from, she had to have a port put in, and that was only you know, a short time afterwards where most people get out of the surgery and they go into a holding room and they watch them to make sure that they're okay from the, you know, knocking them out and stuff and the, the opiates or whatever. The, and so they didn't give her those. They only, you know, did knock her out and brought her back. But right away, I mean, she pre-dosed with cannabis, dosed with cannabis before going into the surgery. And she was smiling almost, you know, 15, 20 minutes after surgery and we were able to take her back to the room and that picture was her smiling in the room. And so this is pharmaceuticals. I've seen the people and they say, oh, well, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm sorry, sorry. This child has no freaking clue what they're giving her. And it obviously worked. And I think we need to understand that better. And this is yeah, part of the mission, right, to spread the knowledge. Um, not long ago, there was another thing that came out. And I'll let it speak for itself. Like heroin, marijuana is a Schedule One drug. Is a Schedule One drug. Is a Schedule One drug. You don't have to memorize this, but what that basically means is the federal government doesn't believe it has any medical value. Right? Although the government may own the patent, <laughs> proving, claiming it has value, right? It makes it really hard to study this stuff. I have called personally doctors, researchers, and it's a vicious cycle, right? They can't get money to do the research, so guess what? There's no research to support it. 
Yet the National Academy of Sciences believes that it works for pain. This year it published that. In states where medical marijuana is legal, listen carefully, where it is legal in those states, there's a 25% lower opioid overdose death rate. That's a lot of lives. People like you, who would have died with 29 pills a day, now we're back, you know, doing all kinds of fun things, not driving on the wrong side of the road, killing yourself, your family, and someone else who happens to be there. Overdosing deaths are problematic for a lot of reasons, but the most shocking hypocrisy here is that studies don't show opioids work for chronic pain. So Michelle should never have been prescribed it in the first place. Medical decisions need to be made by doctors, not law enforcement. And Montel, that's why I think we're not seeing a bright light on this problem. We're seeing darkness covering it up. How can people who have lied to you turn around and now tell you the truth? That's what the problem is. You just said it, and you said it as eloquently as it can be said. 25% reduction in opioid deaths in the states where there are medical marijuana programs. Period. I don't need another stat. Will we stop the stupid and help the rest of this country stop killing people? All right, so here's the assignment for everybody. Today, I'm asking all the doctors who are watching, all the researchers, all of you, to join me in petitioning the government to study marijuana as a solution for chronic pain. Opioid abuse costs $78 billion a year. Let's do the math here. $78 billion a year. If, and right now we're spending less than one-tenth of one percent of this total to support cannabis research, what we're talking about. And now the president says that this is an opioid crisis and it's a federal emergency, right? That's a good thing in a way because that means it's the right time to prove because it's an extreme moment, you can use extreme measures, it's the right time to prove that marijuana can help with chronic pain. Without a shadow of doubt, we get that across, we can change everything, open up a potential opportunity for a lot of people who are suffering. So please go to the Dr. Osho website and sign this petition today and send it to your friends. So, I'm not a fan of Dr. Osho per se, but we took that video right away and we you know, put it out, which some other people did, and we got, you know, like 70,000 views within the day and a half. Um, everything that we can to kind of try to help wake people up understand that this is an important plan. Um, so now, uh, the, you know, then when I give this again, various groups that I speak to, some that have no knowledge, some that have a great deal of knowledge, so uh, in any case, you know, what do we do? It's really important to me, profound of what happened when I started studying this. And I'm, again, I'm trying to figure out how do I heal myself? And so my whole, you know, uh, thrust on this, my whole path has been about medicine, not about getting high. In fact, I am very sensitive to THC, so I learned about counteracting the effect of cannabidiol and other things that I learned later about peppercorn and, and lime, uh, lemon and things like that. But I think it's really important to understand now you guys are going through this whole process of legalization in the state. I've been there, I've been following this, I've been watching that from multiple states, including Canada. Uh, but in any case, I'll go into that a little more. But, you know, when you go to get your medicine or your stuff, I don't care if it's, you know, I consider it all medicine. So I don't care if you're buying a joint and to go have fun with your friends. It should be clean medicine. You need to know, what is that? Who grew it? What products did they use? You know, I mean, in our state, they went from you know, well, we're going to help you in oversight, regulation, and all this. And, well, they have machinery they can't test for, uh, you know, the things that they're saying that they're going to protect us from. They allow 300, 300 some odd pesticides in the creation of it. We went from medicine that was being created uh, for patients specifically to it being grown quickly and fast for weight so that they can make a profit on it. And they're struggling like hell because of all the taxation of it. But in any case, um, same thing, you know, people talk about the hemp. Where does it come from? We've done plenty of looking at that. You know, a lot of the hemp products that initially came out are byproducts of something from overseas. There's no way in hell I'd want to put that in my body, nor use it as they've been pouting as it some kind of miracle substance to help you. So be real careful about that. I mean, I've, I speak at some places like co-op even, and they've got a bunch of stuff in there now, and I'm like, mm, do you know what's in it? You should ask them. It's really important. Just because it's on the shelf doesn't mean it's safe for you. It just, you know, anyway, another long one for me. Uh, the same thing about, you know, so hemp and cannabis. We still can't grow. Washington State, can't grow. You have to be a medical patient. And if you go and get a doctor's recommendation and you sign the paperwork, you give up your HIPAA right. You give your right away to search and seizure. So at any time, in any moment, they can come to your house 
3 o'clock in the morning and search your place because we now have a dead, dangerous devil's leaf growing. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my, my uh, slant, of course, but it's, it's crazy. I just don't get it. It's a plant, right? So um, you guys here, you know, you can grow six plants uh, generally, and, but that's also by area. You know, I was looking on that, of, and you're going down the same path of what I found in these other states. It's the same kind of thing for the most part about now how they're getting their licenses, how many they give out, what they're charging for it, how and they regulate. They want to know what you're growing at home. You got six. They want to know. <laughs> yes, it's just. Yeah, that was a long story in that one. I'm not going to go into all right now, but this is the crazy stuff, which you should understand. So, like, for us, again, I, I ran for office. I, I've been to the Capitol in my state. I lobbied all last year. You know, I've been to all of the liquor, you know, control board, now liquor cannabis board meetings and stuff. And we would go and speak and talk. I testified. And, um, you know, we say we want this or that. And they, they took, you know, uh, they gave us an option about growing, and it was three options that I would never even consider. You know, it was ridiculous. Go on the database. Well, the database that they did, you know, showed everybody their information, like, uh, you know, if they were arrested, their driver's license, social security number, their house, you know, uh, and the federal government, which is still not legal, is have that information. So great, yeah, wonderful. Um, anyways, that's why I left this thing, because one of the last presentations is with advocating go to this thing. Well, they posted their information afterwards and it basically sided with the police and the uh, drug addiction folks saying that it was a terrible substance that needs to be controlled still. And uh, now our legislators during the session that's about to start will make some kind of decision in what they're going to do. Um, so very, very frustrating. So I've learned a heck of a lot <laughs> in this process and I'm very uh, frustrated about, you know, okay, so what do we do? I've been into the pol politics stuff, I don't wanna go into that. Very disconcerting to the way that it works and why. And uh, where are we going? Well, you know, it's really important to me. This is a plant. This is something that existed in our world, as far as we know, going back as far as we can trace in history. You know, it was, it was part of our clothing and etc. It was part of our food. You know, I believe one of the biggest ones that people still aren't even really talking about, one of the guys, uh, Dr. Courtney, and the, about the story of this young lady who was really sick, and she started juicing and it changed. Yeah, yeah, you've got to look up his, you know, the doctor here and there's a whole long thing on that about how juicing saved this woman's life and changed everything for her. It's amazing. Uh, and I used it in my own health when I finally was able to grow some of my own plants for my health. And it was one of the best feelings that I've ever had uh, by juicing that every other day as part of my health regimen. So I think you should really take a look at that. Uh, I mean, you know, when you see some of the stuff I've said, you know, and Montel that fix the stupid. But uh, I mean, we, we allow people to buy cigarettes. We know harms them, you know, et cetera, coffee, et cetera. There are all kinds of things that actually do cause harm. And I haven't found any information yet that cannabis has ever killed anyone solely on its own, unless they were ran over by a truck full of it or something. But other than that, and it's not harming someone. So why the heck are we doing that? So one of the things in my reaction to the whole court thing that was happening, and going, oh God, here we go down the same path, was okay, instead of protesting or going into standing and talking to them and they don't listen, then I'm going to create a uh, event that will maybe help raise awareness. So uh, I started uh, National Grow Your Own Tomato Plant Day, and uh, actually now it's International Grow Your Own Plant Day, uh, Tomato Plant Day, and so the whole idea is that we will have tomato stands set up on uh, March 31st, and we are already getting, you know, people that with the heirloom seeds and stuff and uh, tons of people actually in the cannabis world that want to help with that and actually starting them. And there'll be documentation on our website and stuff about plants and how it's important to grow them and why cannabis should be grown just like a tomato and it grows very similarly in some respects. So, uh, you know, if you guys are interested, please uh, let me know again. We are rolling really quickly on that. And it looks like some of some people that I'm uh, interacting with, friends of mine in the World uh, Health Organization that we have other countries that are uh, very interested in jumping on board and moving forward and also in Washington, D.C. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about some of mine in the last part of this of my effort, Project Positive Change. Um, again, I had, I just made a running title initially of what I was videotaping. And I grabbed a camera, I started running and gunning and <laughs> I just made it a, a temporary thing, but it ended up being this. And I got into a bunch of arguments 
you know, a family about this, of the whole thing about, you know, I'm like, well, it's not just one thing. You know, what I'm learning is it all crosses everything and we need to address this. It's about our health, it's about our medical, it's about our spiritual, our human rights. It's about the environment we live in. And, and if anything, the cannabis plant has taught me a ton that this is about balance. You know, it helps us in it and it's taken me in all these paths to all these different areas that it's like, oh my gosh, this is how this works. And when I started learning about like, you know, what do mushrooms do? How does it work in the environment? Huh. Wow, you know, again, you keep going down the path, you're like, these all connect. So what I you know, started understanding, you know, the, the same, it's all about the tribe, man. It's about the family, it's about us. It's not about these damn politicians and such. It's not about someone telling us when we're doing something that doesn't harm anybody else, it's about what we should be doing that's right. And that, I believe, is what we need to do. We need to become a family again, and we need to get to know who our neighbors are. I was actually here during the Northridge earthquake going to film school in Northridge. Three people in my building died that day. When I went upstairs, after I got, <laughs> I got out of my place and had to uh, go and kick doors open to get them out, they crushed the doors, and I made it to one of the top floors, and the old guy was like, are you with the fire department? I was like, no, are you with the you know, police department? I was like, no, he was like, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm your neighbor. I want you to get out, the building's not safe. It stuck with me, what the heck? We don't even know our neighbors at all, nor, you know, we were already questioning why they would even bother to help you, you know. I know it was a terrible situation, but come on. So I, I decided to focus my energy. So one of the things that I learned from when I first started doing filmmaking in Northern California is I, you know, learned about um, experiences from when I was younger being homeless and things. and. Uh, I saw single mothers that were, you know, dealing with trying to get out of the situation that they were in, and they weren't able to do that if they made, you know, five bucks over, they get knocked off their assistance, etc. So I asked uh, the mayor and community to come together and to set up a building where they could, um, uh, you know, have a, a space for childcare. So the people came together in the community and they got them, you know, the insurance and set up the building and they were able to help the mothers would go to school while the others were watching their children and that helped them get off that. So I came up with the idea, well, what the heck, I'm watching, I'm learning about, you know, all of this stuff and all the communities in all the states, I'm going to Washington, you know, going to Boston and Colorado and Oregon and Montana and whatever, wherever I go, it's the same problem. We have suicide and drug addiction, you know, it's just, it, food problems, it's all the same everywhere I've gone. So again, it comes back to what I've been learning from all this and the plant itself, the plant medicines, that we need to get back to being a family. So I was, you know, trying, or we are working on now setting up mentoring centers where we do the same thing, take a building that we allocate or we, you know, get the funds and buy one and then people from the community, veterans, older folks, anybody that has special skills, life skills in the community, and they'll come together and they will start teaching folks about uh, how they can do that to the active uh, folks in the community. And uh, it's, it's actually going quite well so far and tons of people are helping. Uh, again, we're looking for folks to help us out with that. And, um, you know, so uh, as our stuff has, you know, evolved, and, uh, you know, what are we doing? We're, uh, again, creating awareness by doing things like I'm doing here, coming to speak to you guys, um, you know, going worldwide doing that. We were again a ton of video that no one's seen yet. Part of that was you know time and funding, and hopefully things will change a bunch. And we have so much to share that it's amazing that we're coming out. And uh, you know we've been on radio shows and so forth. And uh, we're looking for folks to help join us in that. So uh, you know the presentations that I've been giving, we're helping other people to do that. So especially in states that don't have you know they have the worst rights going on for them. You know they're being uh, going through all this garbage, I think it's really important so we get young folks to step up and start meeting the people going around and, and raise their awareness by talking and showing what's going on. So uh, what can you guys do to help, of course? Well, obviously if you can donate to help us, that would be great because it costs a lot of money, of course, to do all this. We're on uh, Smile, Amazon Smile, I mean it gives us a very little bit, but you could simply add that when you go to check out. Um, we do positive people or positive change events and we just do uh, fun activities. Uh, if you guys want to do something like that with the same path, uh, we will help with in every way to do that. Um, we were working with nonprofits and stuff as well, so we learned that it's a struggle 
but if we join together, we get a lot more done and we can help each other instead of just being single. Again, it's a family thing. It's something about all of us standing up and making a difference. So we've been shooting videos and helping people for free to do that, to make sure that we can start bringing all these resources together. Um, so again, I never thought in the, my wildest dreams that I would be doing this, but I was born in the beginning of the 60s. And as I say, it's all about the love, and that we need to really change that and make this happen. Uh, we're too focused on other things than we should be. I think we really need to change that. So uh, I hope to join me in that. Um, you know, so basically, in summary, you know, we we know so far that cannabis isn't harmful, um, and the sole use has never harmed anybody, and it's been part of our history far back as we can trace. Um, and there is a bunch of research. I welcome the new research. I hope that we have plenty of that. I'm tired of listening to why it's not. And again, it's a plant. I really believe it should be used anyway. And no one should be telling us otherwise, really, right? Um, so yeah, in 6630507, memorize that one. Someone tells you that there is no research. That's one of the ones you should take a look at. Uh, they did a great deal of research to, do, to show you that. So, um, and get involved and in any way you can. You know, I mean, obviously, I'm always uh, this group. You guys more preaching to the choir, but every way we can, talk to your family, your neighbors, find a way. I, you know, dealing with my family it was amazing. You know, some of them still don't. They just like, yeah, right, whatever. Uh, but you know, learning this information helps. So, uh, the last note, uh, have somebody else that has a little message for us. <laughs> I watched so many presentations, I had to mix it up some. So, um, anyways, I thank you guys for uh, uh, listening. And uh, if you want to get in touch uh, with me at all, that's my information. You can email me, that's my cell phone number. Um, and please give us a hand. We've got material over there in the sign up sheet. If you want to you know, help out in any ways, please do. And again, we're not just doing it out of Washington State, we're doing it everywhere. We're going worldwide as quickly as we can, and we want everybody to help us out with that. So, thank you very much. Right on time, I think we can do one question though. I think I have a really good question. Oh, yeah? Uh, Any questions? I, I really, actually, I do, because no one else does. I never knew that you could take a, like a, a raw cannabis leaf and, and make a smoothie. And yeah. it won't get you high. Well, that's not entirely true. Okay, that's what it sounded like. I, I no, sounded it, like I was looking at something. No, you're right, and it's kind of amazing. So that was one of the things I learned in the beginning. They said, well, you can't get high. And we're talking about you know, the plant in its raw form of the THCA, which again is not really psychoactive, but when it goes you know, heated or in your system, uh, that's, you can change to THC. And THC is what gives you that effect. Again, when it is set, as, uh, I know, I'm sorry about the, the video, was really hard to hear, but you know, CD1, the receptor, when the THC molecule goes there, you know, the cannabinoid, and then you get that feeling. But it's funny, when I was watching one of them, was, uh, <laughs> uh, there was this guy, uh, John Cole, I think he did, he grows, uh, grow, grow greens or something. And uh, I had already experienced so growing my own plant, and then I juiced it, and I was like, I'm so hard. <laughs> What? So he calls this other guy up in California here uh, that does the boogie brew and worm casting, I forget his name, and he, he gets on there and he says, yeah, I'm a really strong cannabis user, I use the best weed, you know, daily, and I haven't smoked anything for a day on purpose for this, because John told me about it, and we're going to try this again. So they put the same thing together, <laughs> mix it up, and you know, mmm, camera goes off, he comes back, he's like, oh my god, I've never been so high, I can't believe I could even get high from this. You know, and so what? You know, I'm assuming again, the metabolism in your body can change the way that it is, and there's a lot of factors in that. So, but it, so it may not be the same kind of a feeling. I'm not sure. It depends on our system. I don't know why specifically in the medical reason, but you know, there's 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 a different way that it can affect you, and that is one of them. I experienced and what he was talking about. So. Yeah, but you can do it in a smaller amount. You don't have to put a ton in it. Well, just for a, a 
just to throw this out for anybody who knows any growers who are in the business, they should grow high CBD plants just to sell in the market now for juicing. Is it, I mean, would, do you think there would be a market for something like that? You need, I a, lot, you need a lot of plants to do this. Yeah, you do. Well, you can well, add a lot of plants. I mean, what I mean, like, is, like you can make a smoothie and yeah. there's leaves in it. Um, yeah, no, but it's not really do the taxes. Oh, will kill you. Yeah. Like, like the new taxes yeah. on the plants will kill you. Oh, is that it? Oh, two is that it? Two seventy-five for an ounce now, just to try to Dry. Nine, nine twenty-five for an ounce. Is plastic cheap? Yeah. 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 Just a leaf is two seventy-five. Is there a future? It's, it's ten by ounces, not pounds. Is there a well, future of seeing this plant in the grocery section of the sprout store? And, you know, like you might say 10 years, anything possible. I, mean, I see it. Just I like mean, a high CBD yeah. version. CBD products well, are, are yeah. way. The, the thing, I just, let me sort of underscore something that happened in our state. So when they, we went from medical to rec recreational, again, and I'm watching it happen here, I'm watching in other states, but that changed the whole thing again and what they're saying what they can do so uh, you know I shudder to see what will happen as we go forward here in California um, and I, I just again I believe what I said earlier it's a plant you should all be growing it and every person you know should be growing it as something in their yard and when, when we start to reach critical mass that could make a big change and so how do we you know that amount of plant you're right I mean that was one of the harder parts for me and then when I got involved in politics and stuff, I backed off on it. There's no time plus concerns of, you know, it's still federally illegal. People in my state were getting arrested when they said, by the coal memo. So uh, another part of that about the whole thing with Sessions is, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is crazy. We don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, if I, you know, we were laughing or joking, but I'm dead serious about this, is I had one of those, those big, huge $500 million jackpot, I would love to take a uh, crop, a uh, seed crop plane in Britain, make a bunch of seed bombs with hemp and cannabis and just flood the world with it. And then we wouldn't have any problem discussion <coughs> of it. It was growing everywhere, right? So that's really, I think we need to do. We need, what we need to do is normalize it. Because, you know, at least my experience in the political aspect of this is everybody went clamoring, you know, like, what can we do? This is, how can we be legal? And isn't this great? I'm like, you know, we have people sitting in prison for having a joint or something, you know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. Is that legal? Is that free? I, it's not, right? I mean, I know a guy in our state that I follow the trial. I watch what happened. He had a legal medical store. They did all kinds of crazy things. I went through the trial and watched how they got up with, you know, lying and cheating and things to get in to buy the stuff and then throwing, he's spending 10 years in federal prison. That doesn't make any sense for something that, you know, is helping and healing us that should be part of our lives again. So I agree with what you're saying, but we get admired in all this other stuff where we should be going, <laughs> one pill, stop, stupid, it's a freaking plant. Throw it, enjoy it. Stop listening to the people that aren't listening to us. They're controlling our lives in ways that they shouldn't be. I mean, when I got involved in politics, I thought, you know, the people that were going and participating in these offices were people that stepped out of their comfort zone to help us be part of our society. And then as I got deeper into it and found out what was going on, I was like, oh my God, there's no you know, logic or reason in this. They're doing things that are ludicrous. And what are, what are we doing? So in any case, that's why I, have the, I think we need to go down that path. So we should be able to, yes, CBD is a great plant. All kinds of things in the plant. There's so many variations. In our state, they've stopped us to be able to grow a specific amount. When they finally give a license to somebody, they give them a 15-day window and tell me what plant you're going to grow. And after that, you can't grow any other type of plant. Watch what happens as we go forth. I have a lot of opinions about that, but that's where we are right now. So.